Ah, the 22nd of June, 2023. This hearing is titled Oversight of the SEC's Division of Trading and Markets. A day that will surely go down in history as the pinnacle of excitement and thrill. Picture this, my dear chums, a hearing so riveting that it could put even the most thrilling roller coaster to shame. Yes, I'm talking about the oversight of the SEC's Division of Trading and Markets. Brace yourselves for a critical examination that will leave you on the edge of your seat, or perhaps even falling off it in sheer disbelief. But let's not get ahead of ourselves, shall we? We must approach this subject with the utmost sarcasm and humour, as is tradition here at Money Mirth. Now let's start with the basics, shall we? The SEC, or Securities and Exchange Commission, is like the referee of the financial world. They're supposed to keep things fair and square, making sure that everyone plays by the rules. Think of them as the strict headmaster of a school, except instead of detention, they hand out fines and penalties. Oh, the joy. So, this hearing was all about the SEC's Division of Trading and Markets. This division is responsible for keeping an eye on the public markets, making sure they don't turn into a chaotic circus. They're like the ringmaster, trying to tame the wild beasts of Wall Street. And let me tell you, my friends, it's no easy task. Now here's where things get interesting. I'd also like to note that it's been more than four years since this committee has had the SEC's Division of Trading and Markets testify. And I can assure you that that will not be the case under our leadership. The Division of Trading and Markets hadn't testified before the committee for over four years. Can you imagine? It's like a teacher who disappears for years and then suddenly shows up expecting everyone to remember their name. But fear not for the current leadership promised to rectify this and engage with the committee regularly. Better late than never, I suppose. Director Zhu, have you conducted an internal investigation to determine how this mix mischaracterization occurred and who was responsible? Oh, well, isn't this just a jolly good topic for us to start our dive today? Internal investigations into mischaracterizations in SEC releases? I mean, who doesn't love a good investigation, especially when it involves misrepresentations? Congressman, the objective of uh, Rule 10b-1 um, is the Donald Frank. I don't, I don't, I don't want to the objective. I want to know whether you have conducted an investigation to determine whether these mischaracterizations, who is responsible for them. It's like a thrilling detective story, but instead of a murder, we have some good old-fashioned mischaracterizations. How exciting. The road to that, Mr. Heisinger. Please answer the members of Congress' question. All right, have you retroactively examined other SEC releases to ensure that they do not contain similar misrepresentations? Yes or no? Dr. Zhu. Congressman, we make sure that um, whatever we say in the release um, achieve the, the policy objective of transparency and, and the investor protection. Um, have you will... gone back to review that or yes or no? I will take this as a no. The SEC is like the financial police of the United States. They're the ones who make sure that all the players in the financial markets are playing by the rules. Think of them as the referees of the financial game, blowing the whistle when someone tries to cheat. But alas, it seems that even the referees can make mistakes. And in this case, we're talking about mischaracterizations in SEC releases. Now, what exactly does that mean? Well, my young Padawan... It means that the SEC has been saying things that may not be entirely accurate. Imagine if your teacher told the class that 2 plus 2 equals 5. You'd be a bit confused, wouldn't you? Well, that's kind of what's been happening here, so why is this such a big deal? Well, when the SEC releases information, people tend to take it seriously. It's like when your parents tell you not to eat too much chocolate because it's bad for you. You trust them, right? Well... Investors trust the SEC to give them accurate information about the financial markets, and if that information is mischaracterized, well, it's like your parents telling you that chocolate is actually good for you. It's a bit misleading, isn't it? Now, from a moral point of view, mischaracterizations are a big no-no. We expect our financial regulators to be honest and transparent. Uh, Congressman, I joined the SEC in December 2021. That's right at the moment. And I joined Congress in 2011. Madam Chair... Can we please, please, would you stop stalling? If not, then we, I would respectfully suggest that we have another hearing with you in front of us so we can get 10 minutes of you stalling instead of five minutes of stalling. After all, they're supposed to be the ones keeping the markets in check. But from a legal point of view, things can get a bit trickier. You see, mischaracterizations may not always be intentional. Sometimes it's just a case of someone not doing their homework properly. 
and let's face it, we've all been guilty of that at some point in our lives. But here's the thing, my young apprentice, in the world of finance, accuracy is key. It's like building a house. If the foundation is shaky, the whole thing could come crashing down, and that's why it's so important for the SEC to get their facts straight. Investors rely on them to make informed decisions, and mischaracterizations can lead to confusion and even financial losses. First and foremost, we need to hold our financial regulators accountable. If they make mistakes, we need to make sure they're held responsible and take steps to correct those mistakes. Just like when you accidentally break your mum's favourite vase, you need to own up to it and try to fix it. Secondly, we need to remember that accuracy is crucial in the world of finance. It's like baking a cake. If you don't follow the recipe exactly, you might end up with a disaster on your hands. And trust me, nobody wants a financial disaster. So, my young Padawan, let's hope that the SEC takes these mischaracterizations seriously and conducts a thorough internal investigation. After all, we need our financial referees to be on top of their game. And if they can't get their facts straight, well, who knows what kind of chaos could ensue. Let's just hope it doesn't involve any broken vases or disastrous cakes. I must say, the Securities and Exchange Commission seems to have found itself in a bit of a pickle. It also appears that they have been relying on summaries of academic literature that are about as reliable as a weather forecast in London, and we all know how accurate those are. Now let me break it down for you, my young Padawan. The SEC, being the regulatory body responsible for overseeing the functioning of the US equity markets, relies on academic research to make informed decisions. They want to make sure they have all the facts and figures before implementing any rules or regulations. Sounds reasonable, right? Okay. What steps has the Commission taken to correct the record act to accurately convey the views of these distinguished academics? I'm not familiar with that particular letter you refer to. Uh, it's, a, it's a study, and we will get you a copy of that. So, this will be in writing the, uh, the, the questions that I can't apparently get answers to today. So, uh, Well, apparently their summaries of this academic literature have been about as accurate as my attempts at cooking a gourmet meal. Let's just say it's not pretty. Imagine this, my young apprentice. You're writing a book report for school, and instead of actually reading the book, you decide to rely on the back cover summary. You think to yourself, oh, this should be enough to get me through the essay. But when your teacher reads your report, they realize that you've completely misunderstood the main themes and arguments of the book. Oops! Now imagine that happening on a much larger scale, with real-world consequences. That's what we're dealing with here. So why is this a problem? Given that the Commission has heavily relied on the summary of the academic literature, have you notified the Commissioners that your summary is in fact unreliable? Yes or no? Congressman, on 10B1, it is a live rulemaking. In fact, uh, earlier this... Okay, week... reclaiming my time. All right. Uh... Well, when the SEC relies on unreliable summaries of academic literature, it opens itself up to legal challenges. Um... <laughs> I'm concerned that you have just made the agency legally vulnerable to challenges in court. Are you concerned about that? We published a uh, reopening of 10B1 earlier this week, so that is <clears throat> that went into the in the public domain. And okay, I guess I'll take that as an I don't care. Imagine if you were on trial for a crime you didn't commit, and your defense attorney presented evidence that was completely inaccurate and misleading. You'd be in quite a pickle, wouldn't you? The same goes for the SEC. If they present inaccurate information in their rulemakings, they could find themselves in a courtroom facing legal challenges from all directions. But let's not forget the moral aspect of this issue, my young apprentice. It's not just about legal vulnerability, it's about doing the right thing. The SEC has a responsibility to the public, to Main Street investors who rely on the stability and fairness of the equity markets. They need to make sure they have accurate information to make informed decisions that protect the interests of these investors. It's like being a superhero, but instead of fighting crime, you're fighting for financial justice. Imagine you're playing a game of Monopoly with your friends. You're the banker, and it's your job to make sure everyone plays by the rules and that the game is fair for everyone. But instead of keeping track of the money and properties accurately, you start making up your own rules and miscounting the money. Your friends would be furious, wouldn't they? They'd accuse you of cheating and demand a fair game. Well, the same goes for the SEC. They need to play by the rules and provide accurate information to ensure a fair and transparent financial system. Accuracy is key. 
Whether you're writing a book report or making important financial decisions, you need to have accurate information. Don't rely on unreliable summaries or back cover blurbs. Dive deep into the source material and make sure you understand the facts. Transparency is crucial. The SEC needs to be transparent about their research methods and ensure that their summaries accurately reflect the academic literature. And finally, accountability is essential. If mistakes are made, they need to be acknowledged and corrected promptly. The legal vulnerability of the SEC due to unreliable summaries of academic literature is no laughing matter. It's a serious issue that can have far-reaching consequences. The SEC needs to step up its game, do its homework, and provide accurate information to protect the interests of Main Street investors. And remember, accuracy, transparency, and accountability are the keys to financial justice. My word, concerns about expertise in crafting SEC proposed rules, you say? Well, strap yourselves in because we're about to dive headfirst into the murky waters of financial regulation. And let me tell you, it's a wild ride filled with more twists and turns than a roller coaster designed by a sadistic mathematician. Now, when it comes to crafting these proposed rules, one would hope that the SEC would have a team of experts with the knowledge and experience to make informed decisions. But alas, my friends, it seems that expertise is as rare as a unicorn in the world of financial regulation. Let's take a moment to appreciate the irony here. The SEC, an organization tasked with overseeing the securities markets and protecting investors, is struggling to find individuals who actually know what they're doing. It's like hiring a lifeguard who can't swim or a chef who burns water. It's a bit like asking me to do a TED Talk on fashion. Sure, I can talk about it, but my expertise is about as deep as a puddle on a hot summer's day. But fear not, my friends, for I have examples to illustrate my point. Remember that proposed Rule 10b-1, Position Reporting of Large Security-Based Swaps? Start off by discussing SEC Proposed Rule 10b-1, Position Reporting of Large Security-Based Swaps. Uh, Dr. Craig Lewis of Vanderbilt, uh, who interestingly had your job, uh, Dr. Wachter, under uh, Chair Mary Shapiro, conducted a review of your economic analysis for propo Proposed Rule 10b-1, and I'd like to submit that, record, uh, that report for the record, Madam Chair. So ordered. Uh, in, in the course of this review, Dr. Lewis discovered that the Commission repeatedly mischaracterized the academic research it relied on to support public disclosure of positions. Well, it turns out that the Commission mischaracterized academic research to support public disclosure of positions. It's like misquoting Shakespeare to prove a point about quantum physics. It just doesn't make any sense, and let's not forget about the SEC's market structure proposal. A bipartisan letter was sent to Chair Gensler. All right, moving on. Um, I know people watching this hearing and maybe even some of my friends on the other side believe that this is somehow partisan when in fact it's simply not true. Last December, Congressman Gottheimer and I sent Chair Ginsler a bipartisan letter on the SEC's market structure proposal. In response to our letter, the chair noted, quote, as is uh, the case in all rulemaking activities, these proposals were developed by experienced staff from across the commission, close quote. Uh, that statement is particularly noteworthy that given just months prior, the SEC's own Inspector General released a report about their concerns surrounding the level of expertise used when crafting many of the proposed rules in question. Expressing concerns about the level of expertise used in crafting these proposed rules. And what was Chair Gensler's response? Oh, just a casual dismissal, claiming that the proposals were developed by experienced staff from across the Commission. Well, forgive me if I'm not convinced but it seems like they're just throwing around the word experienced like confetti at a wedding. Morally speaking, one would hope that the SEC would prioritize the well-being of investors and the stability of the markets. And to the objections, this is ridiculous. This is absolutely ridiculous. And whether we have to do, whether we have to do uh, investigations and closed, and closed questioning, we have got to get to the bottom of these Gentleman's answers. time has expired. But legally speaking, they just need to follow the rules and regulations set forth by Congress. It's like the difference between being a good person and just not getting arrested. One requires a bit more effort and integrity. My dear viewers, it's clear that expertise is a precious commodity in the world of financial regulation. And while we may not be able to change the system overnight, we can certainly demand better from those in power. We can ask for transparency, accountability, and a little bit of common sense. In the end, my friends, it's up to us to hold the SEC accountable and demand that they do better. Because if we don't, who will? And remember, when it comes to financial regulation, 
Expertise is not just a nice to have, it's an absolute necessity. So let's raise our voices and demand the expertise we deserve. After all, it's our money on the line. I would urge my colleagues to join me in protecting the capital markets that millions of Americans rely on for financial security and prosperity. Now, if you'll excuse me, I'm off to make a gourmet meal. Wish me luck. Look out for the next video from Money Mirth. Don't forget to like, drop us a comment, and most importantly, my friends, subscribe. We appreciate you and from all of us from Money Mirth. Take care.